week. So welcome all. Uh, if you're new with us, we encourage you to get our app. Uh, the app is Element City Church in the App Store. Download it into your phone. And that's going to connect you to who we are and what we're about and things that are going on. You, you have really easy access through that app. Um, you also can go to the website as well. Um, but tonight, there's also some great hosts on the online platform that you're watching us from. And if you have any questions or prayer requests or you just want to reach out, those people are there for you and, and would love to chat with you and talk with you and pray with you and whatever, whatever kind of engagement. Um, tonight, following the message, this is for everyone. We're going to be doing communion, and hopefully you have that set up at your house, and you can do that at your house. If not, you know what? Just take that time to spend it in meditation, spend it in prayer, spend it just thanking the Lord and remembering who Jesus is to you, what he's been in your life, and what he's continuing to do in that most precious time. Uh, and then a, a, an announcement you need to be aware of. So September 13th, uh, we're back to in-person uh, worship services, so we're inviting everybody to come back who feels comfortable in doing so. Uh, we will be wearing our masks and, and practicing social distancing, so bring those. We won't be able to give you any of those things. Um, we will not be having e-kids. Uh, we're currently talking to the parents and the volunteers and kind of seeing where we're at with all of that. Uh, so right now, we won't be having anything for the kids. They'll have to stay in service if you bring them. They are welcome, so bring your kids if you want to do that. But man, we, we, we are longing to get back together and we hope this time it's for good and that we can just continue to, to build back into our fellowship and our relationships more and more as, as this, this date approaches. So pray into that. Pray for us as leaders as well that just this whole thing would kick off and go well and, and that once again, we would love each other and keep each other safe in, in the way that we do that. Um, and so finally... Uh, we're going to be praying and praying for the Church of the Week. And again, the Church of the Week, just so everybody knows, is something that I think over 100 churches in Tucson are doing. There's somebody listed, and then all the churches that week pray for that church. And it's this big step forward to continue to build unity in the body of Christ here in Tucson. And we are participating in that. And so I ask you to join me now in prayer. So, Father, uh, we love your people. We love your church, not just our people and not just our church. We love your people all across the globe, all across this nation, and of course, all across this city. And Lord, we, we know today we have united in prayer uh, for New Life Community Church, that they too would be filled with hope, they too would be filled with the light of Jesus, and that they too, God, would fulfill the full calling that you've called that church to. Every member, every person, every family, God, just being blessed right now as we pray for them and ask for your blessing to come upon them. And, and of course, God, we're a little selfish. We pray for ourselves. Uh, man, we want, to we want to encounter you, God. We want to come to know you. We want to grow in rootedness to the word. We want to grow in rootedness to who we are as your people. And so tonight, God, in the message that's about that subject, we pray, God, speak to us. We want to hear from you. We want to be moved by your spirit, and we want to be grounded in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Yeah, just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Yeah, just one touch. My eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. Come on. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Yeah, just one word. You hear what's broken and 
inside me It just won't work And you revive every dream It just one touch I feel the power of heaven It just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe Come on! There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a mountain that He can move Don't praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do Oh, we believe there's nothing that our God can't do There's not a prison wall I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe. All right. For greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise. They all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater faith There's no power like the power of Jesus So let faith arise Let all agree There's no power like His power There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that We'll praise the name makes a way There's nothing that our God can do oh, There's nothing that our God can do There's not a prison wall He can't break through We'll praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can do hope that you believe that tonight there's no power like the power of Jesus and sometimes we need words like that and in 2020 we need a song like that just to remind ourselves there's nothing that God can't do and we know it's been a tough year we know that COVID's happened we know that there's been a lot of social unrest uh, we're in an election year and so we're right in the thick of mudslinging campaigns um, and gosh even here in Tucson this week we lost a legend and a brother in Christ in Lute Olson it's just like, it, it just it, things just keep happening where people are grieving, people are mourning. And what we need is the gospel. We really need to remember the gospel truth that Christ died, that he came and was raised to life to save us. Not because of anything that we did. We never could have earned that. Uh, but because he loves us. So we're going to sing a song that's been around for years. And you've probably sung it before. But here's my challenge. How often do we sing songs where we just kind of go through the words because we know them and they don't really mean much to us. And I want to challenge us tonight as we sing this song, when we sing everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing, when we remember that God is mighty to save, we need to remember that he was mighty to save me. I need to remember that I need compassion, that I need a savior. 
And so this is a song that I'm singing over my life and that I, I challenge you, let's sing this over our lives together. Just as that reminder that he's always there, that he's always faithful, that there's nothing that he can't do. And because that we know that there's, there's power in the blood of Jesus to bring salvation, to bring forgiveness of sins and to allow us uh, to live the abundant life that Christ has called us to. So join me uh, as we sing. Say he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to say. He is mighty to say. Forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the never failing let mercy fall on me and everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. and failures and fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in and now I you to turn it up at home. Let's sing this out. Shine your light. So shine your light. Let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light.
the silence steals my voice You understand me You understand me Come to me In the valley of unknowns You understand me You understand me You understand me, God You understand me So I throw all my cares before you My doubts and fears don't scare you Stop all negotiations with the God of all creation. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought you were. I believe.
the Father's hands Leave the rest in the Father's hands I will rest in the Father's hands Leave the rest in the Father's hands God, so grateful that we can find rest in you, Jesus. God, thank you that we get to meet online or three of us in this room, God, in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for each person watching this right now that you would be speaking into them as, as Jack comes up and, and preaches, God. We give this time to you, God. We ask you to enter this atmosphere, even if it's just in our homes, God. Would you meet us there? We know that you're present always. We trust you, God. We trust that you're gonna move during this time. So thankful that we get to meet in the name of Jesus in our homes, on our devices, on our TVs, God. And I know it's easy to feel isolated because we haven't seen each other in a long time. We haven't been around our community and our church, God, but I pray that you would, your spirit would overwhelm us with a sense of unity, God. We pray for that feeling right now, God. Pray that we would be encouraged, God, through the message tonight, maybe humbled and challenged too. Well, Lord, we give this time to you and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. It is a great reminder that God is bigger than COVID. God is bigger than loss. He's bigger than the challenges that you face and that we face. He's bigger than we can ever really get our mind and our heart fully around, and he invites us closer. And so if you're a part of the Elements family, it's just such a joy to have you here. Maybe you're watching later this week. If, if you're tuning in and you're a guest with us, just checking it out, I just, we are so proud of you for taking ownership of your spiritual journey and investigating it. And I hope that in our time together, you're just encouraged that, that God actually knows your name. And then he's dialed into your life, and he loves you, friend. And he wants to have a relational connection with you. And, and as we have been in this series the last couple of weeks, kind of looking at foundations, I don't know, uh, maybe you've had a home built uh, before Amy and I are in the home that we had built, uh, six, golly, 16 years ago, and I remember the foundation being poured of that home, and maybe for you, you remember uh, your home having a foundation poured, and my hunch is, like us, you did not get very excited about the foundation. In fact, you probably maybe walked out on it, and you're like, oh, it's cement, yay. Uh, maybe when the walls started going up, or you started seeing some of the upgrades that you, you paid for, and maybe uh, you don't have home ownership, and, and so you drive by a certain lot on a, in a strip mall area, and you realize Cane's is coming. <gasps> I mean, come on, can I get an amen? Uh, and Cane's is there, and they pour the foundation, and you're like, oh, big whoop. But when the building starts going up and the, and the upgrades and the signs start going, you realize the drive through might be open because that's all that's open right now, uh, you, you get excited about it. And we tend to think about the upgrades and the things, the accessories. But the reality is if you're a construction foreman, you know that it's the foundation that matters most. Because if that's wrong or if that's askew, then all the upgrades in the world don't matter if things are gonna fall apart. Oh, let's take it out of construction mode. Think about, uh, raise your hand at home if you have been to the, um, the Redwood Forest in Northern California, or if you're here and you've been there and you realize these monstrous trees. The, the Sherman uh, is said to be the oldest tree of there, 275 feet, over 2,500 years old, 25 feet in diameter. And you see a picture here of a, a six-foot-tall man standing in this forest. And the fascinating thing about uh, sequoia trees is 
the strength of the root system. You would think that a tree that's 275 foot taller or taller would have like a, a giant tap root that would sink deep into the earth. But what's fascinating about sequoia trees is their root systems are only about 6 to 12 feet deep. And the strength to stand up to, to high winds and to floods and to forest fires comes from what's under the ground and what you don't see in the roots of those trees. They're like men and women who have interlocked arms, and they're kind of like this army of root systems that have grown together. And together they have a strength to withstand and to fight back forces that would try to push them over and knock them down. And I want you to keep that imagery in mind as we talk about the church and this how does the church continue to, to move forward this Jesus culture and to build that in this calling of the church it's a lot like that root system that there's to have this interlocking strength that we get from one another and I know that's been challenging in, in the COVID season and that's why we've encouraged you maybe with your small group to watch together or with another family to watch together and soon in a couple weeks as we open back up we'll be here and still practicing physical distancing but we're here and for you to know that this is a church where you can be a part of something and to understand that the foundations matter and the foundation of the church is a rooted church and you go back to the early first century and just the beginning of this movement called the church that Jesus established. Remember, he said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he had an agenda and he had a mission for the church to carry out. And that's what we're trying to take some time to look at is how do we go back and understand and kind of root ourselves to the mission and the layout and the purpose and the significance of that movement of the church. There were some key practices that were a part of the early church. And it was kind of like that root system. It's this connectedness uh, that, that allows us to have a deep sense of roots and, and to put into practice some of those key things that we begin to say. In fact, we have a saying around here that the connected life is far greater than the surrounded life. And that it's about being connected one to another. It's that I'm known, I'm not just simply known about, that I'm cared for, I'm not just tolerated, that I'm noticed, I'm not passed over. I'm encouraged, I'm not neglected. I'm valued, not forgotten. And as the church begins to live out and kind of sink its roots into being part of the connected life and having each person find that expression, that you're not just surrounded by people that sort of know you and acquaintances, but you actually begin to live life together and you find a strength. That the connected life is a life that's rooted in strength, much like that root system picture. Uh, you think back to one of the early passages about uh, the launching of the church in Acts chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to Acts chapter 2 or you can open up the app. All the notes are in there and the, and the sermon notes you can follow along. But in Acts chapter 2, is an amazing chapter. I don't have time to read through all of it, but it's, it's the church gathered in the upper room and Jesus has gone back to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit and it's unleashed this, this force, this power, uh, the person of the Holy Spirit given to the church as a gift to each believer. And, and things begin to happen and then toward the tail end of chapter two, there is this expression uh, of kind of, think of it as the, the root system, so to speak, of the early church this rooted church, and what do we begin to see is, is markers of that early church. That's what I want to look at with us tonight. And how do we begin to examine that? And so let's read in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is where it starts. They, so Peter preaches a sermon about three people, 3,000 people say yes to Jesus, and so the church grows exponentially in this moment and that's the they they're talking about just a little bit later as they begin to live out this faith and begin to live out this mission of what the church is meant to be. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
So what's some of the chief distinguishing marks of this early church, this rooted church? What are the roots kind of going down into? And begin to see in this passage. Now, there is a tendency sometimes to romanticize the early church and to kind of gloss over some of the hiccups and the heartaches and the challenges that they faced and, and think, gosh, if we could just find church like that. And, and that's true because sometimes people's image of church is so much distorted from what we just read. And there needs to be a health to it. But I think we also need to remind ourselves that there are some challenges and some hypocrisies and rivalries and challenges and, and heartaches that were a part of the early church. We don't read back into these passages with tinted glasses and miss the blemishes that were there. Paul writes, uh, part of what he wrote in 1 Corinthians was to a church that was not healthy. And so it's not this idea of just perfect rose-colored glasses we see, but there is some genuineness, some authenticity, and some, some deep-rooted practices that we see that the church, the church, Element City Church and the church, is meant to anchor to, meant to practice and to have deep down. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayers. We see that the early church, this rooted church, had a deep sense of learning about it. They were devoted to the scriptures. The scriptures hadn't quite been written yet, but the apostles of the New Testament were beginning to write down the story of Jesus. It's what you and I call the New Testament today. And, and as they were teaching through that, they devoted themselves to understand what Jesus and his ministry was all about, what his teachings were about, what his life and his example was all about. And they began to understand, as the apostles began to teach this, that they wanted to be devoted to this. That it was confirmed by miraculous signs and wonders that the apostles taught. That those apostles are those that lived life with Jesus. And they were speaking and sent by Jesus to understand, to help unpack the story. That part of the major purposes of miracles throughout the pages of scripture is to authenticate fresh stages of revelation. That's why you see it often uh, kind of centered and clustered around Moses, who was the giver of the law, around Elijah, Elisha, and the prophets who were calling people back to God, around Jesus as our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and around the apostles as the church was being established, confirming this is the revelation of God. And so they wrote it down, and by the third century, we have the canon of the New Testament that hasn't changed, and it's for us to anchor ourselves to the acts of the apostles. We are to devote ourselves and submit to the authority of the teachings of Scripture and to the pages of the New Testament. So the, the first mark of the Spirit-filled church is that it's rooting itself in the Scriptures. It, it takes seriously the authority of the scripture seeks to submit to and obey, to align, to live in alignment with the teachings of what God said. And it just doesn't make things up as it goes, that pastors are to preach and teach from the principles of scripture, not just well-sounding philosophies. Now, parents are to train up their children in the roots of scripture, to, into the example of Jesus. This is how we live that you and I as followers of Jesus are to anchor ourselves to the scriptures. That's why we encourage everyone to, to find a reading plan, to make kind of a reading rhythm of the scriptures a part of your life. I have never met anyone who actually makes that a rhythm of their life, who doesn't have a genuine, authentic, growing, real relationship with God. And it doesn't mean they don't struggle at times. It doesn't mean they don't have doubts at times. It just means that there's an ongoing genuineness of growing depth. And we don't read scripture to get through it. We read scripture to get it through us. And it anchors us and it roots us to the heart of God. Uh, secondly, the, the rootedness of that church is that it's a caring church. They devoted themselves to the fellowship, to one another. In Greek, it's literally this koinonia is the word that's listed there. It's the idea that this was a loving church, a supportive gathering of Jesus' followers who were concerned for one another, and they were living out the one another's of Scripture, praying for one another, bearing uh, burdens with each other, that no one was alone. They left people less alone in the way they related to one another. They were living out with care and concern, that it marks the church, that it was a learning church, anchoring itself to the Scripture's second anchoring itself to fellowship, 
to living out, this idea of devoting themselves to that, that koinonia is what we have in common. It's what we have in common that God has given us and what we have in common that we can share around with us. John Wesley said this, there is nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. Meaning, I was made to be connected with you, and you were made to be connected with me and us to one another. That to live out the one another's of Scripture, you cannot do as a lone ranger. That we weren't designed for that. We're enfolded into God's family, a family of diversity and yet unity. A family with different colors and creeds, but one Savior that unites us. We each have individuality and uniqueness, but we have the same equality and value given to us by our Savior. And so this koinonia is this idea of living the connected life. The connected life is, friends, is so much greater than a life that's just surrounded by people. But we begin to live connected with one another, that we bear witness to others outside. Koinonia also has this expression of generosity that begins to live this out. Paul used that word as he talked about the offering of the Gentile church to the church in Judea, this koinonia, this generosity that they gave and invested, that all believers were together, and they had all things in common, koinonia. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone who had need. Now, whoa. That's kind of a disturbing verse if you think about it. Jack, are you saying, like, we got to sell everything and, like, give that over? What does that mean? How, what does that look like in 2020? How do we begin to do that? What is this really getting expression? Does that mean we sell everything, give all the proceeds to the poor? Well, some Christians throughout church history have believed so. And so some have lived this out. Francis of Assisi in the Middle Ages followed that call. Mother Teresa, Sisters of Charity, some are called to, vo- to a vocation of total voluntary poverty, to bear witness maybe to the rest of us that the things around us are not what we own, but it's our relationship with Jesus that begins to own us and begins to give. Now, nevertheless, the absolute uh, prohibition of private property is a Marxist ideology, not a Christian doctrine, doctrine. And so it's not this idea that we have to do this, but maybe this idea that we get to do this, that we get to begin to practice and express more and more this heart of generosity, that if God is so generous in his grace and his hope and his love and his forgiveness for us, that it would only make sense that as I spend more time in my relationship with God, that my generosity would grow. And it would grow financially, it would grow emotionally, it would grow in my time that I invest in others. But it isn't this idea that I have to sell everything. We read later that people met in the temple and they met in a home. So it wasn't this idea, it was this voluntary nature, that this heart of generosity that would grow in their lives would begin to take deeper and deeper root in their life. And the same is true for you, friend, and for me, that as we walk with Jesus, we would grow in our generosity in all ways and in all aspects. Thirdly, that a rooted church would worship together, that that worship would be central to who they were and what they practiced and how they lived out faith. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Luke uses the definitive article in both cases. The breaking of bread is evidently the Lord's Supper, remembering that, and also a fellowship meal thrown in. The prayers is this idea of prayer meetings and prayer services that both phrases refer to Christian worship. Now, Christian worship may have looked different back in the first century, but it probably didn't have electric guitars and lights around. We do. But it was this idea of being marked that they would gather together and they would be for one another together in worship, putting their attention toward God. It would be formal and informal. It would be joyful and reverent. And begin to see this living out in the early church as they rooted themselves to worship, formal and informal. They would continue to go to the temple courts as a part of their tradition, the Jewish tradition. And they would also gather in homes to worship together and to be in this relationship more of an informal setting of trying to encourage one another up in Christ and to build each other up. And so there was a a church element of this and there was a a life-on-life element of this and we want to continue to have that as the church. It was part of the roots of the early church that's meant to continue to pass down into our century, into our here and now. That it was joyful, joyful, anchored to the resurrection of the risen Savior 
that the hope that holds us is not a philosophy and not a religious um, ideology. It's the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. And it's the hope that we have in him and the hope that he instills in us that we get to now worship the risen Savior, that our adoration for Jesus grows and grows in depth and nourishment. It's a joy that fills us and it's a reverence that grounds us that we live in dependency upon him. And it's both and. It's formal and it's informal. It's joyful and it's reverent. And it's always focused back on worshiping Jesus. Worship matters for the church. Their gatherings were centered around aligning their hearts and adoration of Jesus, learning more about him, his way of living life and encouraging one another, building each other up in Jesus. And fourthly, the church is rooted as an evangelizing church. It was devoted to those who were not yet there. Friends, part of the roots of the church that we need to hold on to and anchor ourselves to is that the movement of Jesus has always and will forever be about having a heart for those who are not yet here. It's about a heart for your neighbor. It's about a heart for my neighbor. It's about a heart for people at your workplace and who sit in school classrooms with you or Zoom school classrooms with you. And it's a heart for people who are not yet connected to the love and the hope and the grace and the life of Jesus and the life that he can offer. It's an outward focus more than an inward kind of focus. It's a passion to reach those that God is searching for and that he's searching after to connect with that rescued people rescue people. And the church must never lose sight of that, that we are the rescued ones, that somewhere along the line, Jesus brought someone into your life and into my life that begin to tell the story, maybe in their actions, begin to tell the story in, in literal words, of pointing to the person that changed their trajectory of their life. And it wasn't a philosophy, and it wasn't a set of rules, and it wasn't even a religion. It was about this relationship with this person, Jesus, who came to this earth to live a life that you and I could not live, to die and to sacrifice his life for you, and to rise again to prove that that, that sacrifice was cleared by God, that we might have life with God through faith in him, not in faith in our own efforts or faith in our own actions, that you begin to understand that the early church, that we don't see it in verse 42 through 46, we see it in verse 47, and it says that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That the heart of God is for those who are not yet here. The heart of God is for those that he's searching for, those he's longing to connect, and those he wants to leverage the church, you, me, to reach on his behalf and in partnership with him. That we would be people that begin to live out these the roots of this early church. They were a learning church. They devoted themselves to the scripture. They devoted themselves to one another, to living out in this fellowship of connectedness that they weren't just surrounded by one another. They were connected to one another. They began to live out worship and adoration, to put their attention back on Jesus and to learn from him and to grow in their adoration and affection for him because it changes them. But see, if we, the first three of those if the church just did those, well, if that's all they possessed, it's, it's kind of like an ingrown toenail. It's just self-regarding. And it doesn't allow you to even go and do anything else. But what Jesus did, what the Lord did, was he added to their number daily, those who were being saved, that God has a heart for people who are not yet here. And he longs to use the church. And if the church isn't concerned about people who are outside their window, then we're missing part of the rootedness of the early church. That they lived in this community, but their eyes and their heart were focused outside of their own community. And that's the mission. If the church loses the mission, they lose most everything. 
And so as a church, we're committing our hearts and we're asking you to be a part of that journey to say, church, at Element City Church, we will stay focused on our mission to love and to reach and to pray for and to seek those who are not yet here. That rescued people, rescued people. Because we live out of the grace that we've been given. The Lord added to their number daily. It's his heart to go. Evangelism is the continuous outreach into the community around us, seeking to bring people into Christ and into his community and into the church family. And that you can belong before you even can believe. That you may have some questions and doubts and you're not quite there, but you could still be a part of the journey of people who are trying to live this connected life and who are trying to learn about Jesus and who are worshiping and aiming their life's attention and affection in his direction. And they're seeking to love those who are next to them, who are maybe not quite there yet and that we're pursuing. We must care about those who are not yet here. Jesus tells the story, uh, the parable, remember? of the, the 100 sheep, it's the 99, they're in the pen and one is out and lost. And, and Jesus said, God's heart is he knows these are taken care of. His heart is for the one who's lost. And so the shepherd goes and looks and searches and finds those that are lost and he rescues them. And he brings them into the family and into the fold. See, rescued people rescue people. And that's the heart of the Father. And it's to be the growing heart of you and me as followers of Jesus that we would always anchor ourselves, we would stay rooted to, yes, I'm devoted to the scripture. And yes, I'm devoted to one another that I need you and you need me. And I'm devoted to living a life of worship, but I'm also devoted to being open to whoever God's gonna bring across my path. So here's my challenge for you tonight. Our mission, David said it earlier, Invite people into a life-giving, life-changing relationship with Jesus. We must never detour from that. It's part of the roots of the early church. It's to be parts of the roots of the church for 2,000 years and for the next 2,000 years. That God's heart is for those that are not yet here, not yet connected into a life relationship with him. And so here's the challenge for you, is who's your one? Who's your one that you feel like that God's putting that person upon your heart? They keep crossing into your path and they keep intersecting your uh, kind of life status and, and just the way that you're living. Maybe even in this COVID season, he just keeps bringing this person across your path and across your mind. Who's your one that you sense God is saying, hey, I want to love this person and I'm searching after this person. And I want this person to come into a relationship with me. And I actually want to leverage your life to be a part of that story. So friend, who's your one? Who, who can you begin to pray? And, and all of us as a church, as we begin to pray for one, that we pray that maybe between now and the end of the year, that we might be given an opportunity to share the story of Jesus and how he's changed our life. And just begin to invite people closer to who Jesus is and how he's changed us. See, the rooted church, the early church, had this interlocking system of strength that they were for one another, this fellowship, this kononia, of living the connected life. And they put their attention and worship toward Jesus. And they anchored themselves to the scriptures and they, made, they stayed open to who God wanted to add into their family and into their fellowship that they begin to, to reach and to live with a heart for those who are not quite yet there. Friends, let's commit as a church to have those kind of roots as a system of our church, the heartbeat of who we are. And, and so as we close our time and get set to, to kind of end with a worship song, I just want to invite you right there at home. We talked about taking communion together. And so I want to invite you to maybe have some of those elements ready, uh, maybe the cracker and the juice or Maybe uh, when I left, I think we had uh, maybe some juice and cheese nips. That's what we were doing at home. And so whatever you've got, it's the anchoring of ourselves back to the hope that we have in Jesus, to his life. And so we remember and read kind of what the apostle Paul talks about. 
this idea of anchoring yourself. This is one of the practices that was given to us to remind us that our life and our hope is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. Not in our effort, not in our energy, but in the, the grace of his rescue. And so Paul had these words, and then I'm going to give you a moment uh, to take communion at home and to pray as a family or to take a moment as a couple and pray. And then we're going to continue on with worship. And so I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. Here's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Pause there for a second. This is my body, Jesus said, which is for you, separated by two commas. But it's an amazing truth that Jesus came for you, friend. That if you were the only one, he still would have come for you. He's that kind of rescuer. He's that kind of shepherd. He's that kind of savior. You're the one. 99 might be settled. You might have been the one that was lost, and he came for you. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat. Jesus uh, also, in the same way, after supper, took the cup, saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. It's pausing to remember that it's his blood shed on that cross where you and I should have been. He didn't deserve to be there. We did. And yet he stands and stepped into our place to make us right with him. And so at home, take the bread, take the juice, take a moment to pray. And so, Father, we just give this next moment to you as we pray to you and thank you again for the beauty of the anchor we have in communion, to remember, to stay rooted to the grace of Jesus. So as we prepare for this last worship song, would you take these next 30 seconds and pray in your own, in your own house? And God, would you meet us? Would you let these prayers rise as a prayer of thanksgiving to you? In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful trust you I don't need to understand so make me a vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing but all you have given me Jesus bring
Pretty powerful image uh, that Jack gave us with the uh, redwood trees. Uh, I know pretty well because I grew up in that area. Uh, it's where they filmed The Return of the Jedi, with those same trees. And when you stand there and you look up, you can't see the top of them. It's truly majestic, it's truly awe inspiring, and that's what we were created to be. It's through the pressing, and this song we just sang, it's it's through the crushing, it's, it's through the pressing together and outward to the world that we become that rooted system of trees that brings glory to Christ. And I, I invite you guys, especially that those of you who call Element City Church family and home, really begin to pray for us. Pray for each other, pray for our home groups, pray for our gathering times, that we would really begin to build this fellowship in the very rootedness of Christ, amen? Uh, Friday night is another opportunity. Uh, we, we've created time here at, at the courtyard, here at the church, um, seven o'clock on Friday night. It's just a really an open time to pray, to testify, to tell stories, to pray for each other, to worship together, to do these things that Jack just preached about, right? They think about it, they did it daily. And I have found there's been times in my life where the move of the Spirit really increased and I found myself meeting with people daily to worship, daily to prayer, and it, and it gets intense. We need that, right? Like a lot of us have been separated for long periods of time and we need that fellowship. So I really want to invite you to come out Friday night and engage with us in that time. Uh, once again, for those of you who are new and are listening, uh, the host can guide you and direct you to the Zoom call afterwards where you can connect. Uh, once again, we're inviting you into this journey and into this community with us. Uh, once again, I want to thank all of you out there that have truly continued to generously give during this whole season that I know has been hard for everyone, but, been, but we can see that most of you have continued to give generously and regularly 
And once again, that shows the connectedness. That's part of that rootedness that we're committed together to all partake in this uh, with our time, our money, and our energy. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're trying to build here. We're trying to build into what Jesus has built into us. And so uh, just thank you once again for joining us and look forward to meeting with you guys soon. Again, the 13th is the first time that we're going to have in, in-house, uh, in-person services. So please be praying for that time so that when we do come together, it's special, it's exciting, and, and, and I'm sure that the Lord will meet us in that time. So Father, we ask you, build in us, God, a beautiful temple. Pull us together, God, in a rooted system of trees that would, that would stretch to the heavens and bring you glory. We want to be that kind of people, God. We want to be that city that's set on a hill that does shine out to those in darkness, those who, who haven't found a community, those who haven't, who've lost their family, those who are looking to be connected to the Creator. That's where our fellowship is truly at, is in the Spirit, it is in Christ, and it is in the Father. And Lord, we want to be a light to invite people into that fellowship that we have found and that we are so thankful for. So God, we thank you, and we ask you to once again speak to us and call us once again into this world to be the church. Amen. God bless you guys.